welcome back to my channel. All right, it is time for the next installment in my Pearson Comprehensive Guide series. Today's topic is all about the vertical labret Pearson or Lebre, because I keep hearing it both ways. And it's another one of those things like the Dath Doth situation where I don't know how to pronounce it. So you know what? I'm gonna end up having to say both. But my patrons this month did vote on the vertical Lebret Pearson, which I'm pretty excited for because it's one that I love, but I'm not sure I would get myself. But never say never. If you are new to this series, basically what I do is every single month I put out a comprehensive guide on a specific Pearson. All of these topics are voted on by my patrons over on Patreon. So if you would like to vote on the next guide, you can go check out my Patreon and just see what's going on over there. But yes, I'm very excited because I do really love this Pearson. I just don't have it myself. And also if you are new to how my Pearson comprehensive guides work, they are broken down into five categories. First, what is said Pearson, procedure and pain of that Pearson, healing and aftercare of that Pearson, and then the fun parts, jewelry sizing and jewelry options. Let's go ahead and get started. What is a vertical labret piercing? So the vertical labret piercing is a piercing that is located on your bottom lip and it actually goes through the bottom lip. Now what makes this piercing unique is that one entry point is through the lip and the other one is at the bottom of the lip. I will be sure to have pictures over here so you know exactly what I mean because sometimes I feel like my descriptions are not great. This is what one looks like. As you can see, one of the entry slash exit points is through the lip, whereas the other one is at the base. So like where I used to have my just regular old Lebret Pearson, that's where one of the exits entrances are. What's unique about this lip Pearson is that it is entirely on the outside of the mouth. So as other lip Pearsons come in contact with the inside of your mouth, this one does not. So if you are worried about like it rubbing against your teeth or against your gums, you don't have to worry about that with this Pearson. Like we've talked about before, some Pearsons are definitely anatomy based, anatomy dependent, and the vertical Lebret is one of those. In order to successfully have this piercing, you need to have a little bit of a bottom lip. And what I mean by that is when you look at your lip, you'll notice there's like a little ridge where it almost looks like it overhangs, like a little bit of a, a little bit of a shelf or something. That's the kind of lip you need to have. If you have a very thin lip that's kind of flush with the rest of your face, it's not gonna work. There needs to be enough tissue there for the jewelry to kind of hold on to. Now, this is not to say that thinner lips can't be pierced. However, it is kind of up to the piercer as to whether or not they feel confident or feel like they have enough experience in order to tackle that. But for the most part, you definitely wanna have a little bit of a fuller bottom lip and you want it to have a little bit like a ridge, like a little bit of an overhang, just so that jewelry has something to grab onto. So now that you know exactly which Pearson I will be referencing in this guide, let's move on to the procedure and pain of getting one done. Now, because it does actually go through the lip, it may be a little bit more painful than other lip Pearsons. And by painful, I mean it just might pinch a little bit more when it's done. However, I have heard a lot of people say that this one hurt them a little bit more than they anticipated. And as always, when it comes to a Pearson that I don't personally have, I take to Instagram and ask over there, hey, those of you that have this Pearson, what was the pain like? And so I got a few responses back and the average came out to be a six out of 10. Not like in the middle, it's a little bit on the higher end of the middle, but also not the worst. A lot of people did comment that the top part, so like, how it goes through is from the top to the bottom. A lot of people said that this top part, when it enters the actual lip, not below it, but the actual lip, they said that's where it hurt the most. A lot of people referred to it as a pinch or pressure, but they did say that it, it stung a little bit. Because of the placement of this piercing, it is very important that it is centered. You want it to be pretty symmetrical with your face. You don't want it to be off to the side at all. Again, this is where anatomy plays a role. You want a little bit fuller lip that will give it the ability to be centered and not have to fall to one side or the other. And then of course your piercer will wanna look for any veins or anything to avoid in the lip just to make sure that they don't accidentally puncture that. Like with all piercings, your piercer may or may not use a clamp. This is up to personal preference. Some find that clamps hinder them while they're piercing, others find them to be extremely helpful. More often than not, a clamp will be used for this one, but again, it is personal preference on your piercer. So don't like be like, oh my God, my piercer didn't use a clamp. It's fine. They just may have found that it got more in the way than it would help them. And as always with 
other piercings. The piercer will clean the area, disinfect it, mark it, let you look at it, and then go from there. Now, whereas with other lip piercings, you will most likely use a mouthwash to just clean out the inside of your mouth because the piercing will be at some point touching the inside of your mouth. You're not necessarily gonna have to do that for this one. You may find some piercers that still ask you to do it just to like clean up your mouth area a little bit and like clean up your lip and stuff like that. But because this piercing doesn't come in contact with the inside of your mouth at all, you're most likely not gonna have to rinse with mouthwash. And make sure that when the piercer gives you an opportunity to look at the mark that they've given you, make sure that it is centered, make sure that it is as straight as possible. Your piercer is gonna have an eye for that kind of thing and you might not be able to move it as much. There's not gonna be as much wiggle room just because you want to make sure that it is dead centered. But again, if you don't like the placement, speak up. And from what I've heard and seen, most likely how the piercing is done is from the top to the bottom. So the piercer will have a clamp or freehand it and the needle will go in from the top of the lip and then come out through this little exit area. They may reverse it, but more often than not from what I was able to gather, they'll go this way. So now that you know what to expect when you get it done, let's move on to everyone's favorite part, healing and aftercare. And if you couldn't detect the sarcasm in there, well, I'm sorry. Roughly healing takes about six to 12 weeks. It's a pretty fast piercing to heal. And again, this one is not touching the inside of your mouth. So you don't have to actually worry about like bacteria or the saliva or anything getting on it which is pretty cool. But it because it is a fleshier area, there's a little bit more blood flow getting there, and so it heals a lot faster than say a cartilage piercing. That said though, it can take much longer depending on a bunch of different situations such as improper aftercare or anything that may irritate it. When you first get it done and you like, or eating, maybe your fork hits it, or your glass because you're drinking something hits it. Those types of things can prolong the healing process. So six to 12 weeks is like standard, but it could take longer. It's just one of those things where you have to become very mindful of it when you basically relearn and to eat with this new thing on your lip. All right, standard aftercare for any kind of piercing. Let's hear it. You can either do one of two things. You can make your own, or you can buy a pre-made formula. I highly recommend Neomed. In case you didn't know, I am partnered with them. So you get 20% off your order with code Gretchen20 at checkout. I'll have that in the comments below if you wanna go order some. That is a great just pre-made one for you to have, especially because the nozzle is pointed. You can just spray it right onto your lip. So that is a pre-made option for you. If you wanna go the route of making your own, please, 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 please make sure you are doing the correct measurements and ingredients, very key. So in order to make your own, you need eight ounces of distilled or bottled water. Do not use tap water. There's stuff in tap water that can irritate your piercing. You wanna make sure it's distilled or bottled. So you have eight ounces of that water mixed with one eighth of a teaspoon to one fourth of a teaspoon of non-iodized sea salt. Do not go over one fourth of a teaspoon. Just because you added more salt does not mean that it's gonna heal faster and in fact may irritate it more and prolong the healing process. You're just gonna mix that together. Because of the placement on this lip piercing, you could do something like just put your lip into the cup of water and just like let it sit there. If you don't wanna do that, you could just do something along the lines of like take a Q-tip, put it in there and just clean around it. Again, a lot of people are not a fan of Q-tips. I personally have never had a problem with them. It's more so you've gotta be mindful of the little fibers that come off of Q-tips and could get wrapped around the jewelry, but it's definitely an easier method to clean. Make sure you're not overdoing the cleaning. Twice a day should be enough, maybe even three times a day if you notice crusties. You don't want the crusties to build up because that can lead to irritation. Cleaning it once in the morning, once in the evening, and if you notice throughout the day that it needs a little bit more more cleaning, you can do that as well. Make sure you are not using things like Neosporin, Bactine, or alcohol products on your brand new Pearson. This is technically an open wound. Don't be using these products on there. First of all, Bactine tells you on their website, don't use us on a Pearson. I think if the product itself is telling you not to use it on something, common sense says don't use it on something. So please don't use Bactine. The company even tells you not to. Alcohol products dry the skin out. You don't wanna do that around a brand new Pearson. Also, I feel like that would just burn, because again, Pearson is technically like an open wound. It's a puncture wound. Can you imagine getting like rubbing alcohol into that? Do you remember when we were like kiddos and we'd fall off our bikes and skin our knees up and we'd put hydrogen peroxide and stuff on it? Yeah, it's not a fun feeling. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. It's just, 
don't do it. And then Neosporin prevents oxygen from reaching the Pearson site. It does need to breathe in order to heal properly. Neosporin also clogs the puncture wound and won't allow it to drain, which is what those crusties are. You need the crusties, but you also need to clean the crusties away. I know it's a lot to remember, but it's just one of those things where it's just like, just make sure you're doing proper aftercare. But all of these, again, are way too harsh for our Pearson, whether it's new or old, just don't use any of them on a Pearson. And I say this all the time, don't mess with the jewelry. I know it's gonna be, you know, something fun that's on your lip and you're not used to it and you're probably gonna do something like take your tongue uh, 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 around on it, try and move it and stuff like that. Don't do that. Or even with your teeth, you know, doing stuff like that. Don't do it. Don't mess with the jewelry. The only time you should mess with the jewelry is when you're cleaning and even then minimal movement, just don't. Don't mess with it. Again, make sure to clean away the crusties. You don't want them to build up at all. For this type of piercing, even though it's not inside your mouth at all, spicy food can pass over your lip. Try and avoid spicy food while it's healing because I imagine that would not be a good kind of spicy when the spiciness goes across this puncture wound. I feel like that would not be pleasant. So just avoid things like spicy foods while it's healing, at least for the first few weeks. And if you notice swelling, which I can almost guarantee you, you will, you can put like an ice pack or something on it, like wrap it in a paper towel or what have you, and just like place it on the lip so that the swelling can go down. Cold compresses can really help for swelling like that. All right, moving on to everyone's actual favorite part, jewelry. Let's start with jewelry sizing. Typically, you will find yourself with a 16 gauge curved barb bell about 5 sixteenths of an inch in length. However, initially it will probably be 3 eighths of an inch in length to account for that swelling, but then you can downsize at about six weeks or so. And then you're gonna wanna do that because you don't wanna accidentally bite on the jewelry. Again, it's not on the inside of your mouth, so you won't come in contact with it as much as other lip piercings, but there's always the possibility that like it could be super long and like pop up like into your other lip or into your teeth or something like that. So once you are able to downsize, I highly recommend doing so. And now your jewelry options. You're kind of limited on what you should wear in this piercing. However, there are more options available to you with it. More than likely, you are gonna have a curved barbell, which is just that little curve to it. And that's more than likely what you will have in the piercing initially and what you'll probably stick with. Now, you could do things like a horseshoe, circular barbell, so it's a little bit more of a C shape. You could do things like a captive bead ring or septum clickers or things like that, but you may not want to. I personally don't know how comfortable that would be because like the ring part will sit on this other lip or be protruding at all. But hey, experiment if you wanna try something other than a curved barbell. More than likely though, you will have a curved barbell. And then as always, all Pearsons can have retainers and retainers are just clear glass or plastic pieces of jewelry. So they can also be curved barbells. So that is just some basic information regarding the vertical labrette Pearson. Tell me, how many of you have a vertical labrette Pearson and what was your experience like with it? What was the pain of receiving it? How has it been to heal? What kind of jewelry do you wear in there? That's the part that interests me. Cause again, more than likely, Curved barbells are gonna be what people have, but I'm interested if there are others out there who have something different. Let us know in the comments below if you have this Pearson. Let us know in the comments below if you're thinking about it or if you used to have it or just anything regarding it, cause I'm fascinated. I love this Pearson. Again, not in the market for it right now, but hey, you never know. Never say never. Special thank you to my patrons. You can help support the channel on Patreon while having access to videos early, view and patron only content and more. But that is it for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to go down there and hit that subscribe button as well as that notification bell so YouTube will let you know when I upload next. But until next time, bye all.